Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in our Dare to Teach series where we are trying to define as best we can what we mean by the integral teacher. We are now to the final tw number 12 of the core values as I've defined them of the integral teacher, gratitude. Now the assumptions here that you've been working with our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left hand side, the Dare to Teach playlist. Um, I gave two introductory lectures, this seems like a long time ago, I gave two introductory lectures followed by these 12 different core concepts as I'm outlining them. I took them in groups of four. The first, uh, honesty, forgiveness, freedom, and love, compassion. The second, uh, justice, hope, I saw those together, courage, joy, and peace. And then finally in this third section, we've been talking more kind of brass tacks uh, types of in-classroom ideas with discipline, uh, purity, grace, mercy, we just finished with and now Finally, uh, gratitude, and since we're speaking of gratitude, can I pause for a moment and just say how truly grateful I am for you guys, both here as well as those online, who have been following this set of conversations. It has helped me to be a better teacher by engaging in these ideas and uh, the possibility of our exchanging these ideas in what we are calling the Dare to Teach uh, Integral uh, Teacher uh, summits or, or, or conversations. Um, we, we hope to be able to engage in even more of these real, really as face-to-face. -face. I said when we began that I love stories. We are the stories we tell. We are the stories that we continue to tell. We are the stories as well that we decide to either accept or to reject. And, and I, there's a couple of stories that I want to finish with because in 303, as I share them with my students and now as I share them with you, I just love these stories. Uh, the first of these stories is, the, of course, the story of Scrooge. Uh, we love Dickens' Christmas Carol. It's such a powerful story. I mean, think about the power of the story. So you have this multi-billionaire. Dude, this guy has everything one could hope for with the obvious exception of a life, right? I mean, proof that just because you have certain things doesn't mean you have everything. And notice what happens that evening as he is visited by those three ghosts. The first ghost takes him all the way into his past. And of course, it upsets him to see the things that he has once had that he no longer has. The second ghost will come and, you know, apparition will come and show him uh, the present. You know, and there's people making fun of him and, you know, make, making light of the, of, of the silly, really, it is a silly life that he lives, although it's obviously a very important life, it's a very acclaimed life, and yet it's a silly life. It's a life of fame that's empty fame. Uh, and then there's that third ghost. Now, it's the third ghost we're always intrigued by. And it's the genius of Dickens that this word picture is so profound. Why? Because the third ghost shows up and doesn't say a word. What's, he, what's the third ghost do? Takes him, takes him to, his, to his tombstone. <laughs> Scrooge is not interested in looking at his tombstone. Scrooge is interested in looking anywhere but his tombstone. And what is it that he does in that moment? Man, oh man, is this instructive. In that moment, falling on his knees, begging for what? One more, just one more day. Would you just give me one more day? Because all of a sudden, everything about his life becomes pristinely clear. In other words, he's always known this moment was coming. Hello, the, the, the whole story starts with a visit from his old pal Marley, the ghost. And yet, for some inexplicable reason, Scrooge has lived all this life somehow imagining that he lives in a world where he's never met a 200-year-old person. Just, it's, it's inexplicable. And yet, it speaks directly to, I think, what is foundational about this story. We are all in this boat together in that regards. We have a tendency to very quickly forget. We haven't met any 200-year-old people. And we've got to let that fact sink in. And because that's true, when we come face to face with our end, whether it be our physical end or whether it be the end in our classroom, we don't want that to be a surprise for us. We don't want that to be a complete shock. And that's why our second story is so vital in room 303, one I love to share with students as well. And it's, the, it's the, not the Scrooge story, it's the Socrates story, right? Because here we have an old teacher who has gotten himself sideways, crossways with, of course, the establishment. And he's brought to trial. And, of course, he's going to be condemned. And there is the cup sitting on the table full of poison hemlock. And... Socrates is ready to have a good conversation. He's lighthearted. He's happy. Of course, his students are all distraught. They're crying. They can't believe it. He asks them, what is wrong with you? 
Well, I mean, haven't you been paying any attention to anything I've been saying? I mean, did you expect me to live forever? I mean, I have to go bye-bye sooner or later. And uh, think of it this way. If my life to this point has been an odyssey, a voyage, we think about Socrates as the new Odysseus, right? Then isn't it also possible that what's about to happen after I drink this hemlock will be my next journey? And to that degree, of course, he makes this amazing argument for the existence of soul. It has been a very important idea down through time. And yet, the key lesson for us, from Scrooge to Socrates, is the following. We know that the moment of our death is coming. Five, four, three, two, one. We're going to flatline. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. I haven't met any 200-year-old people, which tells me what? All the people breathing on this planet in 200 years ain't going to be breathing on this planet. And I know that moment is coming. And when that moment comes, here's the insight for both the Scrooge story as well as the Socrates story. And it's simply this. At the moment of our death, we all say the same words. The same words are, oh my God. The only question is the inflection of the voice. Think about this. Most people live their life and come right up to the moment of their death. And the words they speak are, oh my God, but the inflection in their voice is, oh my God. What have I done with my life? Oh, think of Scrooge. If only I could just have one more day, one more day to put it right. And of course, Dickens allows for that one more day to happen in a number of days after that. And Scrooge is better than his word. And of course, Scrooge lives his life with a certain kind of insight, perspicacity, can we call it wisdom, that says at the moment of most people's deaths, there's a lot of regret. Think about your teaching career as a life. And think about that final moment when you walk out of your room for the last time. Now, I've had teachers that say, no, 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 don't bring this up. This is just too, I love this thing called teaching too. Yeah, but here's the thing, no matter how much we love it, we, sooner or later we're going to have to walk. i got to walk out of 303 someday, and that'll be my last time. My last time as an instructor in this room, and I will leave this room. There, there's a sense that most teachers leave the classroom with a lot of regret. If there's anything that our series of talks, I hope, has been able to address, it's that challenge. Here's what you don't want. What you don't want is to walk out of your classroom for the last time, whenever that is, whether it's because of retirement or it's happening here in a few weeks, months, whatever. It, it doesn't want to be about regret. It doesn't want to be with a spirit or an attitude of longing for a return to somehow fix all of the things. Oh, if only I could have a few more days, a few more months, a few more years to fix all of that. We've got to find a way. Because, obviously, we recognize something they were teaching to us at a very, very young age. I love to teach my students this fact. And it, it's enlightening to them, and I think it should be enlightening to us. And it's important for me as well to remember, because the only sin is to forget. We have this tendency to not remember what we were being taught at a very young age. Think about it. There I am at the park swinging away. I love swinging at the park, it's so much fun, the beautiful sky, bumping my heads on the clouds, when all of a sudden some adult in my life says, it's time to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. No, 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 you don't understand. I know you don't want to go to the van, honey, but we can't sit and swing at the park forever. We've got to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. Boy, think about the power of this word picture. Our whole lives as children, we were being taught a simple truth. We get to swing at the park, but only for a very brief period of time. The van is always waiting. We all have to go to the van. Now, of course, in our own life, we know this is absolutely true, but we also know this is true in our life as teachers. The van is waiting. We will sooner or later have to walk out that door, and we will never walk back in as the teacher of that classroom. It is coming. And if that's true, then the challenge to us is self-evident. If I only get a small, small window of time in my classroom swinging at the park, that's precious. And I want to be able to recognize it as precious. And I want to have a certain spirit of gratitude about the fact that I'm here, but not for long. What a compelling idea, it seems to me. Because it now reinvigorates everything that I do in this classroom. For example, this is the last time I ever get to speak to a class of group of students. Well, I want to make sure it's the very best. It's the very best that I can give of my energies and of my time, of my uh, longing to show them authenticity. Every moment should be, I hope, that kind of an experience because our time in the classroom is precious, if and only if, obviously, we can see it that way. So, obviously, the question is, can we develop an attitude of gratitude? Remembering. Gratitude is, for me, a form of remembering because, as we said, the only sin is to forget. We have this tendency to forget the things that matter the most to us. 
Until, back to the Scrooge story, we have this moment, this epiphany of its loss. And then and only then do we all of a sudden wake up. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves, ourselves awake, right? Infinite expectation of the dawn. Remember our, our, our Thoreau lines from an early lecture? Let's try to remember then as I now finish. Let's try to remember the first day we entered our classroom and the last day. And to see that moment as inevitable. And yet not depressing, uh, as we sometimes have said, to see the moment of your death before it actually occurs is what we call wisdom, which is, of course, the precursor to gratitude. That perspicacity, as we have said. And our challenge here as teachers is to see the end now and, and to enjoy now what we have. Because we know that we've got to move on to other things. Socrates was excited to move on to his next adventure, his next odyssey. I challenge teachers, including myself, who have been doing this for a while, to recognize it's got to happen. You can't stay doing this forever. Even the great Harold Bloom finally had to leave his classroom. And if he could do it after all 50 plus years, obviously the rest of us have got to follow suit. We've got to leave. But the challenge is to do it in such a way. Obviously, Harold Bloom is a classic exemplar for us. And we've got to do it in such a way that when it's time to leave, we're ready to go. We're ready to go to the van and to say, I've done the best job I could swinging. And I've done it for myself, for my students, and for those outside. Which obviously begs the question, can I pursue a spirit of gratitude epistemologically? Notice I'm back to my big five one last time. Can I enjoy, can I be grateful for that fallibilist attitude. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And when I am shown that I'm wrong, when I finally come to discover that what I thought was true is not true, am I able to enjoy that gift? Because that's what it is. It is a gift. Think about the ways that students teach us every day new insights. Ontologically, can I have gratitude for the fact that I am a body, I am a mind, and I am a soul? And can I, a spirit, can I, can I enjoy and appreciate that fact? And can I grow in all of those areas vis-a-vis -vis the four quadrants as the integral idea uh, expresses it? Can I have gratitude for my psychological fears? Wow, my fears can teach me a lot, can't they? If I can just find a way to learn through them and from them. How about the sociological challenges? Can I have gratitude for my colleagues? Find the one person that you work with in your community, whether it's on the PLC or it's in the school somewhere, that you have struggled with. Can you actually be grateful for that individual? They might be the yeast that bakes your bread. They may be the one person who has taught you the most in your teaching career, you just didn't see it that way. Can I be grateful for the student? Oh boy, this is a challenge. Can I be grateful for the student who pushes me, who challenges me? The student who I sometimes look at and I think to myself, my first instinct is, I can hardly wait until you're no longer in my room. And can I change that attitude? Can I look at that student with a genuine acceptance of that student? Being grateful for that student. Wow, what an attitude. And finally, of course, can I have a certain attitude of my theodicy? Can I be grateful for the moments of pain and suffering? It's not that I want those moments of pain and suffering in a classroom, but when I get them, can I learn from them? Why did this happen for me? Can I do that and change or alter my constant feeling the need to somehow play the victim, to say, I wish this wasn't happening to me? No, no. These are the days that must happen to you, as Whitman will say, and we're going to get to Whitman in our final set of comments here in a little bit. Can I help my students? This is why I love the 10-turn challenge, the 10-day 10 10-turn 10 challenge, as I said from our study earlier. Little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and love. Challenge our students, challenge ourselves to witness all of the way our life is constructed around those little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and love. Can I point those out to myself? That's a form of gratitude. Can I Promise myself that for 10 straight days, I will not sleep at night until that day I am able to say out loud, today I committed a little nameless unremembered act of kindness and love, and I did not need anyone to appreciate it, to honor it, to say anything about it, because in the end, the greatest gift is the gift I give to myself. Well, we come to the end, and I like to end where we began which is why I love my T.S. Eliot's and why I love Four Quartets. And let's come back now to the lines that we started with at Little Getting Five. What we call the beginning, 
is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. We shall not cease from exploration. This would be my challenge to all of you. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. With that in mind, and a good number of you have said, wait a minute, you started with Song of Myself, passage 46, 47. I know I have the best of time and space. It was never measured, never will be measured. Uh, but you didn't really explicate. You just simply read it. Can we talk about it? And I say to you in our final conversation, sure. Let's talk about it. Song of Myself, passage 46, 47. Come back and we'll try and put all 12 of these ideas together as we study that passage. Thank you.